Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. The subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay, and I come to you amidst the tumult of many red-hot culture wars over abortion, gender, the January 6th riot in the United States, COVID. But today we're not going to talk about any of those things, even if my guest, famed evolutionary biologist and author Richard Dawkins, is no stranger to such debates. Instead, we're going to talk about his new book on the science and wonder of flight, In Flights of Fancy, Defying Gravity by Design and Evolution, he takes us through an expertly explained and beautifully illustrated exploration of some of nature's most astonishing flying creatures, from the six-meter wingspan of the Argentavis down to the tiny hummingbird, and the various insects, dinosaurs, and even glider-equipped rodents and fish that use principles of flight to travel through the air. And we humans make an appearance as well not only as creators and pilots of manufactured flying craft, but also as dreamers and myth-makers, fascinated by the balletic feats we observe in the skies above us. Richard Dawkins joined me from his home in Oxfordshire. Here's the recording of our interview. Why flight? Why not burrowing or running or hopping? Oh, well, that would be very nice too. I mean, I could imagine that for the next book or the one after. (laughs) Okay. The book is about dreaming of flying and that many of us do dream of it and try to design machines to do it. I think it's a fairly obvious topic for a biologist interested in science generally to tackle. It isn't just dreams. Uh, In some cases, it's delusions. You talk about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, author, of course, of the the Sherlock Holmes books, and, and he was quite convinced and even wrote a book about it, that there exist fairies, tiny little human beings with wings, uh, he wrote a book called The Coming of the Fairies. This is a, is a kind of yeah, obsession. Yeah, astonishing, because he was a, he was a scientist. Uh, he wrote books. Uh, I mean, both Sherlock Holmes and Professor Challenger are his heroes, and they're both highly rational men. It's very hard to understand. I mean, I think it, he was writing at a time when the camera could not lie. And, of course, nowadays we know it's very easy for the camera to lie. That's a partial excuse, but it's rather hard to excuse such incredible gullibility. I mean, as I think I said in the book, he should have thought to himself, if they were human, little human, they must have evolved from apes the same as the rest of us. So how did that come about? I mean, where did the wings come from? All that sort of thing should have occurred to him as a scientist, as a doctor. And yet, if you look at all the other incredible adaptations that have taken place around flight, one in a thousand or one in a million ants will temporarily grow wings so the queen ant can find a new nest. I mean, obviously this fairy stuff is nonsense, but there is actually some precedent in evolutionary history for creatures who who don't otherwise have wings to sprout them. I think you put it the wrong way around. I mean, ants are rather unusual among insects in not having wings, and so they're descended from winged wasps. It's rather that worker ants have lost their wings. And queen ants retain the wings that their ancestors had. I, I guess a narrative could be built that we're descended from fairies and we've lost our wings. Yes, that's right. <laughs> we were talking about the fascination with flight. Is this connected in some way with, with religion? Does every major religion have some version of, of angels? I don't know the answer to that. Islam does. Islam has angels. It has the angel Gabriel. They had uh, Muhammad riding on a winged horse. Ancient Greeks did, ancient Romans. Yes, from the top of my head, it's, it seems fairly common, at least, to, for religious ideas to, to include flight. You have an interesting aside where you talk about Leonardo da Vinci's depiction of angels, and you suggest that he must have been somewhat embarrassed, maybe, to, to render them in a traditional way, because he had presumably the engineering knowledge to know that the wings he was drawing would never have been able to bring Gabriel up into the air. 
Does it sort of take away from some of the romance of artistic depictions of winged creatures when you look at an angel and you say, that angel's just never going to get off the ground? Yes, I mean, I would have thought that as a, one of the world's great anatomists, he must have wondered where the angel kept its muscles because the wings are just kind of stuck on the bat and they've got to have some kind of muscles and muscle attachments right. to beat those wings. This is something that a layperson probably never thinks of. I didn't think of it. You can't just sort of staple wings to something and say, okay, go fly. You have a wonderful illustrator, Jana Lenzova, is that her name? Yes, indeed. She shows, for instance, what the inside of a hummingbird looks like. It's an engineering marvel, of course, the way those, those wings beat fast, but it isn't just the wings. The body has to be organized in a way to project that power to the wings. Let's say humans did have giant wings. What would have to happen to the rest of our body to support those wings beating? If they were like birds, they would have had to have had a huge pectoral muscle on, on each side and a gigantic keel to fasten the pectoral muscle too. What does that mean by keel? A breastbone sticking out in front. So uh. if you think about a, a chicken, which is not a great flyer, but never, nevertheless, it has very big breast muscles. And those breast muscles are attached to a keel, which is a bone sticking forwards. I mean, it looks like a keel of a, of a yacht. Like where our sternum is? Yes, that's right. I mean, it, it is the, the sternum of the bird. Gabriel would have had to have had something like that to attach his massive wing muscles to. There's such an incredible range, and I didn't think of this until I read your book, of the way birds fly. On one extreme, you have the hummingbird, whose, whose wings beat so fast, it's actually incredible that it has the energy to sustain flight. But then on the other extreme, you get these gigantic birds. Argentavis, the great big bird that looks like a condor. Well, that's, that's an extinct bird, I think. But Yes. I suspect that that probably probably glided rather more than, than flapped. I, mean, I imagine it didn't flap its wings very much, if, if at all. And you have, you have birds of prey, and you can see them even here in Canada. You can see them circling around. They seem to be sort of engaged in a kind of arbitrage of up currents and finding hot air and cool air. Their instincts guide them in a way that sometimes they don't have to flap their wings at all, and they are more like gliders. Is the term flying kind of almost too simplistic? Well, it's a good point. Uh, gliding and flapping are two different things that birds do. The bigger the bird is, the more it tends to rely on gliding rather than flapping. I think it's okay to use the word flying for a creature which stays up indefinitely, which is what these birds do, whether they're flapping or gliding. Whereas things like the flying squirrels, which only glide, they only come downwards. They start high from a high tree and they glide downwards towards a lower tree. So that you would not probably want to call that flying. But something like a vulture, which uses thermals to spiral upwards and then glides to the next thermal. And they, they can flap as well, but even if they didn't flap, I think you would want to call that flying because they can stay up indefinitely. And then you have this incredible example. God, I'm going to mispronounce this. The Quetzalcoatlus? Quetzalcoatlus. Yes. As big as a giraffe, I think you say it was probably the biggest living creature that ever was able to sustain powered flight. There's one theory that it used a kind of pole vault technique to get into the air. It's almost like a vertical takeoff and landing thing on a modern aircraft. That's really because of the, the riddle of how it got off the ground. Coming from a high cliff, it would have been easy just launch itself off like a hang glider. But if it ever did get stuck on the ground, the question is how would it actually get up? Once it could get into a thermal, it would be okay. Suppose the idea is it might pole vault itself for just enough to get into a thermal. But then on the, on the other extreme, you talk about, I didn't know this, swifts. They spend, you say, almost their entire life in the air? They even copulate in the air, yes. Copulating is one thing, I can see that. But how do you sleep in the air? Uh, well, they, they, they manage it. The one thing they don't do is nest in the air. I mean, they've, they've got to come... They've got to come on to come to land in order to nest, and they and they nest in high places. Can birds sleep while they flap their wings? Like, can they put their yes. wings on kind of autopilot? So they're they're flapping their wings in their sleep. Uh, I I yes, I think so. I mean, they, they they certainly fly when they're asleep. You also have a section: shoebill storks, giant moas. Uh, these are extinct, gigantic. Uh, this one's called a terror bird, a, a capybara. Uh, a capybara is is not a bird. A ca capybara is a is a, a sort of giant guinea pig. Y Yana had the picture of the terror bird, which she imagined was about to eat a capybara. Ah, uh, uh, okay, I misinterpreted that. The pictures here are very evocative, and it does look quite terrifying. 
how did these things go extinct? Because at one point, presumably, they did have the power of flight. So they had the power of flight. They could go anywhere and find their prey. It's like a supervillain. How could something like this go extinct? It, it happened before there was anybody around, so nobody knows. I mean, we, we know that in the case of moas, which are the giant New Zealand birds, they went extinct when the Maoris arrived in New Zealand. So they were hunted to death by Polynesians, by the, by the Maoris when they arrived. And the elephant birds of Madagascar, again, went extinct pretty soon after humans arrived in Madagascar. I mean, the, those two birds went extinct sufficiently recently that we kind of know how it happened. One odd, to my mind, phenomenon that happens is on small islands where there aren't predators, birds lose their power of flight. It frequently happens, yes. Could you explain the reason why you get this, I guess, reverse evolution process? What's interesting is they retain the impulses. So you talk about birds, their wings shrink, but they still put them out to dry. They retain that instinct, even though the wings have shrunken to such extent that they can't fly. There's a rather charming piece by, do, do you know the author Douglas Adams, the, co the comic writer Douglas Adams? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide, Guide to the Galaxy. That's right. He's got a rather d delightful book about animals that are going extinct. And one of the birds he talks about is the kakapo, which is a, um, a New Zealand bird. Not only has the kakapo forgotten how to fly, it's forgotten that it's forgotten how to fly, and so it still tries. <laughs> and he describes how it climbs up, up a tree and then launches itself off the tree and plummets to the ground because it's forgotten that it's forgotten how to fly, which is a rather charming image. But you raise a serious qu question because you might say, well, why don't we all fly? I mean, what you know, what, why is it only birds, bats, pterosaurs and insects that fly? The fact is dramatized by the fact that so many animals have lost the power of flight, that must mean that flight is not all that great a thing to have. It's nice to have for some purposes, but not for all purposes. And in the case of island birds, where there, there are no predators, they tend to lose the power of flight. I use the fact that queen ants bite their own wings off as a dramatic illustration of the fact that flight is not actually all that wonderful. Not every animal needs to fly. Worker ants don't fly. It would be a nuisance to have wings underground, perhaps, that is the reason in that case. Flying is costly. Not only does it require a lot of energy to fly, it requires a lot of energy to make wings in the first place and to make flight muscles in the first place. Energy is a very important currency of life. So it really does seem as though flight is great for certain purposes, but if those purposes are not there, then the animals will not fly or will actually lose the power of flight. And now a message from one of our sponsors, BetterHelp Online Therapy. So the pandemic is ending, and maybe you're one of the many people who expected that as soon as things got back to normal, you'd be feeling back to normal too. If not, it could be because you've gotten burned out without even knowing it these last few years. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment or fatigue, and more generally, it can include no longer feeling as much joy or satisfaction in the things that you usually love doing, such as, oh, I don't know, writing or podcasting. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. And you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Plus, it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. So give BetterHelp a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Quillette podcast listeners get 10% off their first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash Quillette. That's B-E-T-T-E-R h-e-l-p dot com slash quillette and now back to our quillette podcast one of the most interesting and i guess complex set of evolutionary trade-offs that you discuss is in the case of birds that fly over bodies of water looking for food sources and then turn their bodies into essentially dive bombers go right into the water and adopt an extremely hydrodynamic form and grab the fish. I mean, people have seen this maybe when they're on vacation in the ocean. It's quite stunning. They're almost like transformers where they transform from a flying machine to a kind of fish. But then you talk about trade-offs. Like, for instance, some of these birds, their eyes suffer from the impact with the water. 
have you looked at the trade-off between the adaptations that allow swimming and, and flight? I guess the penguin is an extreme example of this. It's an incredibly good swimmer, but don't ask it to fly, right? No, it's not, not a very good walker either. They're brilliant swimmers. Penguins have gone all out for water. So they've got their brilliant swimmers, as you say, and the wings have shrunk to be ideal for, so to speak, swimming in the water. They use their wings as, as propulsive organs in the water. Puffins also use their wings as propulsive organs in the water, but they also fly with them. So they're neither perfect for flight nor perfect for swimming. Puffins are awkward flyers and they're awkward swimmers, whereas Penguins are brilliant swimmers and don't try to fly at all. And other birds, of course, are brilliant flyers and don't try to swim. Birds that dive bomb, as you say, that those are gannets and boobies. They, they do pretty much turn into fish when they get underwater. Cormorants do too. Cormorants use their very large feet to propel themselves underwater. And they tend to use their wings just for steering. They're, they're pretty good flyers. I hadn't heard of this bird, although it, it's, it's legendary among people who study this kind of creature. This is the great auk, yes. which was, I think, a distant relative of the penguin. The penguins live in, in Antarctica on the other side of the world. Why did it go extinct, whereas the penguin didn't? Is it just because it was happened to be in an area where humans were looking for food? I think it was. It was shot by humans. This is a sort of a tangent, but if there were one extinct bird that you could resurrect through genetic means, because you actually in the section about the great arc, you talk about how it may be possible for the genome to be sequenced and then Jurassic Park type scenario where it comes back to life. If there were one bird we could do that to, may I ask what, what your choice would be? Archaeopteryx, but that's so long ago that it couldn't be done because there'd be no surviving DNA. Uh, the passenger pigeon, which went extinct pretty recently, the passenger pigeon was a, a, a North American bird, which flew in gigantic numbers. I mean, huge flocks. The sky was darkened with passenger pigeons and they were killed by humans, but not that long ago. And so there would be some hope, I suppose, of finding enough DNA to revive them. You talk about how pigeons, carrier pigeons, until fairly recently in human history, were a military technology. Uh, before telephone lines and radios, it was, this is the way generals got messages to each other. <laughs> That's one of the ways, yes. That's right. But there were all sorts of intrigues whereby, I don't know, like the Germans were shooting down British pigeons or... Yes, I, I, I did write that. I, I got that from somewhere. You describe human efforts to figure out exactly how it is that birds are so good at geolocating. Is it now understood, the mechanisms at least, how birds are so good at migrating and geolocating? I think it's still an, an active area of research. And certainly magnet, magnetism comes into it. Sun compass comes into it. Geographical features come into it. It's a mixture of lots of different things. I did have a fairly big section on Stephen Emlin's work on star navigation where he put them in a planetarium. There's also, um, let's see if I can find it. Ah, here it is. Uh, the indigo bunting's inky footmarks on the side of the Emlyn funnel indicate the direction in which it wants to migrate. This is, this is a, a bird called the indigo bunting. Yes. I think his, his feet were inked so you could see where it was going. But the, the planetarium one is even more evocative. The researchers actually altered the position of the fake stars. I think the experiment was a success in the sense that when they rotated, the, when they rotated the universe, as it were, the bird changed direction. Right. That's right. What Emlyn did was to bring up young birds, young indigo buntings, in the planetarium, and showed them a night sky which rotated around a different star. I mean, normally, the, the the night sky in the northern hemisphere rotates around Polaris, which is right over the North Pole. And so, the, what the bird learns is that the bit of the sky that doesn't rotate is north. All the rest of the sky rotates. What Emlyn did was to bring up baby buntings in a planetarium where he rotated the night sky around a different star, namely Orion's left shoulder. And then those birds treated Orion's left shoulder as though it was Polaris. They treated that as though it was due north. This is a level of... I don't know what to call it, instinctive calculation that you would not assume they were capable of doing given the sizes of their brains. Uh, and yet butterflies do some version of that when they, they migrate to certain areas. Is, is this instinct encoded in their brains or is it just simply part of the, like, the nervous system connected to their eyes and other sensory organs? 
Yeah, well, you have to remember that when a bird does almost anything like flying and avoiding obstacles, it's, it's making calculations in its brain, which are just as sophisticated as the calculations that we're talking about in this migration case. But we take that more for granted. You, you and I, when we, when we catch a ball, we are making mathematical calculations subconsciously in our heads. And if you had tried to program a robot to catch a ball, it would be extremely difficult. And yet our brains do it subconsciously. And so similarly, bird brains are doing a subconscious calculation. One takeaway from the book was an appreciation of the common feather. There's one picture that shows a bat side by side with a bird and their innards. And, and the bat's bones extend out to the tip of the wing. Yes. Which, which is kind of the way an engineer would design it. Yes. But then you have that side by side with... A bird is on page 96 of your book, the illustration. The bones of the bird only go out about maybe a third or halfway down the wing. And the rest of the structure is made up of feathers. Yes. Could you explain a little bit about the engineering of how sheaths of feathers sort of duplicate the effect of a rigid or semi-rigid engineering surface? Well, feathers are wonderful things because they're kind of stiff in a way, but flexible also. And so they have... A great virtues which bone doesn't have. Because birds' wings are made of feathers, they can alter the shape in a way that it's difficult for a bat to do. Feathers are very complicated structures. They have a, a spine up the middle, and then they have these side branches, and they have little combs, little, little hooks. You can tell if you take a feather and pull the branches apart, then you can zip them up together again. They really are really like zip fasteners. That's one of the reasons why birds spend so much of their time preening their wings to keep the, the zipping correct. The feather is, is a wonderful thing, and it, it enables birds to fly very successfully. When you see a bat fly, there is something recognizably non-bird-like about the way a bat flies, although I don't think I could describe it. It's sort of like jitters and careens back and forth. And from what I've seen, bats don't typically fly at high altitude. Is that difference in flight pattern connected to the different structure of their wings? I would suppose so. I, I Like you, I, I notice a difference in flight pattern, but it's an intuitive thing that's hard to describe, and I, I'm not sure what that's due to. At one point, you mentioned that there was only four decades that passed between the Wright brothers' first powered flight and the advent of supersonic flight in the middle of the 20th century. So this incredibly rapid pace of technological change. But in my lifetime, there hasn't been that much change. You know, when I was a kid, to go from Montreal to Miami was three hours. 50 years later, it's still three hours. Has human flight plateaued? This has always been a subject of science fiction. It's sort of like everyone would have their own personal plane or helicopter. You, you have this one picture, this amazing thing. It's called the Gossamer Albatross. It's this incredibly lightweight construction, I think it's 30 meters from tip to tip, and I think this incredible athlete was able to, to pedal it across, I think it was the English Channel, which I thought, oh, that's cool, maybe we'll all be able to do it one day, but then I found out that the whole plane, including the pilot, was 98 kilograms, and the only way they were able to do it is with this incredibly lightweight pilot, incredibly lightweight high-tech plane, probably a team of engineers. I mean, I myself... I'm not quite 98 kilograms, but I think I'm 90 kilograms, so the whole plane would have to weigh 8 kilograms, and I don't, I'd probably generate half the power of this guy. It'd sort of I'd be like the gossamer toad or something. <laughs> yes, yes. Is there a future in which the car will be replaced with some kind of personal hovercraft or plane, or is, 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 that, is that something that could ever happen? I suspect it is, yes. I mean, I think if you think about the way a drone works, expand a, a drone to be, to be man-sized. I could imagine that that would be these prototypes already being produced, I believe. It takes a lot of energy, though. I mean, helicopters are very... Well, oh, no, it, it could never, you'd never be powered by human muscle power. It would have to be powered by something like fossil fuel or something of that sort. But yes, I mean, I think that, that might come. The, the other great advance that might come, I suppose, is, is um, rockets. Imagine being launched in a rocket from London and come down in Toronto in very much faster than present flying through the atmosphere. I'm kind of curious about how much you want to travel on a rocket. You've got this picture of a guy on a hang glider on page 114, and it says, I've never tried piloting a glider, and I think I'd like to. For somebody who's obviously fascinated by flight, 
how much have you actually done in your life in terms of, I don't know, parachuting or... Actually, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> it seems quite terrifying, actually. I agree. I could imagine going up in a fixed wing glider. And in fact, I've had a letter only a couple of days ago from a man in Cambridge who said he would like to take me up in a, in a glider. And I, I might take him up on it. I, you just reminded me, I want to reply to him. I could never jump off a cliff with a hang glider. I mean, I've seen people doing that. I'd just be too scared. I'm just scared of heights. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Richard Dawkins is the author of many famous books, and his latest is Flights of Fancy, Defying Gravity by Design and Evolution, with illustrations by Jana Lenzova. Thank you so much for being on the Colette Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 